There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another Friday Reads. And I spoke too soon when I said probably the Alfresco Friday Reads were done for the year because today's a beautiful, fairly cool day. It's about, well, according to my, according to my iPad, it's 13 degrees, but it certainly feels closer to 20. So I'm a little embarrassed that I wore such an old shirt that you've seen a million times. I would have worn one of my new blouses, but I thought I would debut my new my new fall coat but it's way too hot to wear that so here we are <laughs> and i'm in a shady spot because i thought did bring my chair and here we go in terms of what is new my mom has been taking me out gallivanting and going with me to a couple different really deeply meaningful experiences uh, last weekend we went to wanaskewin and wanaskewin is about a 15 minute drive out of Saskatoon, north of Saskatoon, I believe. If I forgot my directions right, I probably don't. Um, and it is an indigenous cultural museum archaeology center, a drama space too, I think, a lecture space. I mean, they do all kinds of wonderful things. It is just, well, gorgeous, but it was just such an incredibly heartful experience for me to finally go. It's been there for 20 years, 30 years. I never had any inclination to go until I started on my journey of, of um, under, beginning to understand and uh, connect with Indigenous issues in Canada. And now it's the only criteria by, by which I judge my own country, which is why you've heard me say some pretty bald statements. I'm not going to repeat any of those today. But Mom and I went. There was uh, an exhibition of birch bark biting art. So this woman, I think she lives in British Columbia, I'll put up a gift. Um, she bites into the bark to create these images and then um, other artists use those designs to design clothes and things like that so that was phenomenal and we ate at the restaurant there and I had a bison stew that was one of the best stews of my life uh, and the people working there were all indigenous I think I'm pretty sure and they were incredibly friendly and helpful and Mom and I just, Mom had been there a few times, but she really wanted to take me and I was so delighted to go. And we didn't know that they have a dance performance every day after lunch. And it's often hoop da a hoop dance. And that's what it was that day. And we caught on to it when this young man, he wasn't as young as he looked, but this young man in full uh, traditional indigenous uh, regalia, I don't mean like with a, not like a chief, but he was dressed up for a hoop dance, and I don't know how to describe what he was wearing. I'll put a picture uh, so you can see what... I, I won't share any of the videos, but you can find lots of hoop dance videos, including if you Google... Um, hello, geese. You can... If you Google Wanna Skewen and hoop dance, you'll find lots as well. So I think he's in his 30s, and he has been hoop dancing since he was a child, and he is... Uh, teaches hoop dancing at school and he, the hoop dancing is his whole life and the way he explained it and the spirituality of it and the performance that he did I, I was just it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen he invited everyone to come up and he taught elementary <laughs> hoop dance things and I just I'm not in the physical condition or I didn't know what it would involve or stuff so I just watched and mom got up <laughs> Everybody else, almost everybody else got up and it was a joy to, to watch. So I didn't mean to go on so long about it, but I will be going back there repeatedly uh, now that I live in Saskatoon. And then I'm just going to put in a little vlog here. I'm going to edit it down very short, a couple minutes maybe, of yesterday mom took me to the second annual Reconciliation Day. And I'm, I'm pretty cynical about Reconciliation Day because... Uh, I think it's just lip service, like most days that are a thing that people think they're doing something when they're not. Well, it wasn't nothing. It was beautiful. 
it's a step in the right direction. I don't think it gets us very far, but it was beautiful. The commemoration of the people we have killed in Canada, uh, residential schools, tens of thousands of them, of murdered and missing women across Canada over the decades, and so on and so on. So the commemoration was was beautiful. So just uh, here's a little bit of a clip of what, what it was like. And you get to see my first Saskatoon vlog. Uh, it's fall and it was down by the river. And yeah, so have a look. Hello, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. This is a vlog for the second annual uh, Canada Reconciliation Day. I'm down at where the, there's going to be a march. It's or, Everybody's in their orange shirts, you can see. And down on the river, on the west side, I'm going to show you. There's going to be a program here after the march. I, my mom and I are in no condition to march very far, so we came to where they all end up in this gorgeous park. The leaves are starting to turn. You can see the um, uh, Chinese, uh, what do you call that? Not a pagoda, it's just a Chinese, uh, oh, anyway, whatever that is, it's beautiful. I've never seen it in real life, only on YouTube before. And today is a day of remembrance for all the shit we have put indigenous people through. So I, I'm very, moved to be a part of it. Let me just show you around this park and the river. coming spring. my last can of Japanese coffee that I bought a couple months ago and so I put it on the stove in a pot of hot boiling water and it's cooled down enough that I can start to drink it mm. and holy smokes did I have a reading week did I have a reading week it was kind of like a, a scavenger hunt without an aim type of reading week 
In other words, I, I ended up reading a lot of stuff that I had no intention of reading that I found at libraries and I just, you know, looking for short books and this and that. So I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'll narrate all that as we go. But here are the stats. I figured them out in advance so I would be less likely to screw that part up because I know the accuracy of my stats are important to you. <laughs> I have one bale to talk to you about and I have one book that I've started and not yet finished. And I have finished five, and four of those I started this week. So that's what I mean. It's just been uh, quite a quite an unexpected and really d rich, rewarding, heartful reading week. Okay, I can't wait to tell you about it, and I'm um, I'm probably gonna have to move around. The sun's getting pretty bright, but yeah. there, just that little bit got my face out of the sun. So you'll be surprised about my bail, I think. I certainly was. I decided to bail on this uh, new biography of Queen Alexandra. Queen Alexandra, Loyalty and Love by Francis Dimond. Um, there's only about two of you watching that care about this sort of a book, so I'll be brief, but maybe three of you. <laughs> and the others you've already fast forwarded. You've already used the timestamps to jump to the next one, so I don't have to be that brief. <laughs> um, this was obviously a labor of love for the author, Frances Dimond. There she is. She looks, she looks lovely. And she was granted access to Queen Alexandra's letters and diaries, which I don't think other scholars, other biographers had been, but that's all she used. And so she didn't, she, she had this treasure trove of, of material, of, of original, you know, in, Queen, in Alexandra's own words. But it's it's what what she did with that ended up being a bit of a quite a bit of a failure for me. What this book is is a diary dump. So we get often with Alexandra's um, thoughts and feelings about the events. But basically, what this book is is a day by day, week by week narrative of what she did, who she met, which art galleries she opened, which which painter she sat for for a portrait. And when it involved her family and her relationships with her family back in Denmark or new family in the British royal family, it was pretty interesting. But when it was just that humdrum stuff that none of us would want to do, even for the money the royals get to do it, to open this and go here and uh, all that stuff, some of it must be pretty monotonous. And, and all of that, just we uh, literally day by day, and then at the most expansive, the most she ever does a summary is one week in one paragraph. Never anything more briefer than that. Uh, now, I'm such a geek about the royal family that Brit British royal history from Queen Victoria to the present mostly, although that keeps going a bit backwards now to the back to the Hanoverians and forward, that there was a part of me that in did enjoy it. But the way that I enjoyed it was to Google every reference because she'd refer to people, courtiers, or per, people that were famous in Victorian Britain that I didn't know anything about or much about, and I'd Google everything. And so it just was taking forever to read. I can't remember when I started this. Um, I may have started it in January, I don't remember. But anyway, it's months and months ago. And I got to page 200. And here's the main thing that made me bail. The biographer, doesn't talk about any of the big issues. She's so focused on this day by day, week by week, month by month, diary dump approach to Queen Alexandra. And I didn't even get to the part where she became queen. I stopped in 1875 to 1879 chapter. Uh, she didn't become queen, of course, until 1901. Of course you won't do that, right? <laughs> and she gave such short shrift to the major personal issues of Alexandra's life that that's what I just why I decided to bail. We got up to I'm mean, in 1876 or something. She's been married to Albert who became Edward the seventh for 10 years. More than 10 years by this point. And there has only been one half sentence reference to the fact that he slept around with tons of other women. Half a sentence. And of course Queen Alexandra didn't write about this stuff in her letters or in her diary or whatever. I can't even remember if she wrote a diary, but in her personal papers, there wouldn't be any reference to it. But the fact that the biographer doesn't introduce that is one of the major th things of her life. She knew that he was carrying on. I mean, she invited his most uh, 
steadfast mistress to visit him on his deathbed. That there's nothing here, so she doesn't she doesn't step back from these primary sources that she got access to. To talk about Alexandra in terms of the things that the larger issues of her life. And the other one was that Queen Alexandra, she was quite deaf from a very young age. She wasn't totally deaf. I think she might have been totally deaf in one ear. And it's never explained. It's never gone into. And just a few cursory references in passing, usually quotes from other people's letters about how deaf Alexandra was. I knew a whole bunch more about Queen Alexandra's deafness from reading books about Queen Victoria and this and her husband than, than is in this book. So and I thought this is just ridiculous. She can't see the forest for the trees. So I bailed. Um, what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to do it in a big rush, but in the fullness of time, I want to read a, a decent biography. Um, probably I'll have to buy one that's gone out of print. I think this might be the only one that is in print. But, but I want to read a decent biography of Queen Alexandra, and then I might go back to this and keep on with the diary dump because it wasn't boring. It just was taking forever and it wasn't giving me a picture of who Queen Alexandra was, so that's why I bailed. That sun is just going to be taunting me. I'll keep going for, for a while, but I don't know. I don't like being this squinty, goddammit. All right, now I'm in shade for, for a few more minutes. You don't have as much of a, of a view. I think I just got the lawn behind me. Anyway, I started a whole bunch that I finished, but the one that I started and haven't finished, I'm delighted to tell you about. This is a German novel set in Scotland, The Peacock by Isabel Bogdan, translated from the German by Annie Rutherford. There's the translator's name on the cover, as it should be. And as I've mentioned before, I watched the book launch on Zoom when it came out, and I, had, I think I'd already ordered a copy, and I'm finally getting to it. For Shorty September, which ended yesterday, although my Shorty September is going till the end of the year. I love this. This is a strange little story, and it's set in the Scottish Highlands. A laird and lady, who are both professional working people, but they are Scottish nobility. I don't know if that means that they're... I don't know anything about the nobility in Scotland. Are they all Anglo-Scottish, the nobility? I, I don't know. But anyway, laird and... La Laird and, not Lassie, Laird and Lady Macintosh, <laughs> and they can't afford to the upkeep, uh, the property taxes and all this stuff on their estate. So they have turned it into, uh, they rent out all the, all the parts of the estate, all the buildings and parts of buildings that they're not actually using, they rent out to, uh, as a very quiet, rustic getaway spot for tourists and such. There, there is a matter of factness to the way that <laughs> the story is described that um, carries with it a lot of uh, wonderful humor and I find myself smiling. This might be another book that makes me happy. Uh, smiling at the story, but more than that, it's just so well told. And yes, they have peacocks and they didn't know anything about peacocks when they got them, but they thought it would be a bit of a something for their paying guests to enjoy looking at. They didn't really understand that that mating season is very short and that the rest of the year you don't even really see the peacocks. But unfortunately, just on the eve, and I mistakenly, I think because of that kimono, I mistakenly, or maybe there's something about Japanese people, Japanese guests later that I haven't encountered, but on the eve of a bunch of British banking executives coming for a teamwork building summit retreat, one of their peacocks starts going berserk and she, he maybe, she, I forget the gender, but anyway, what does gender matter, people? <laughs> um, it, it just gets horny as all get out whenever she sees anything blue and she tries to fuck it, or he tries to fuck it. Um, blue car, and, and they're quite a strong animal apparently and they can cause significant damage, um, dents, Anyway, it's may it's mayhem, people, and what are they going to do? And sure enough, the the most senior of the executives pulls up in a blue car, <laughs> and that's basically where I am in the story. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it more than that would suggest, although that is quite an enjoyable premise, don't you think? In that the characters are quite well drawn, and I have a sense, especially of Lady Macintosh and her uh, assistant. Um, 
I don't remember her name, but she breaks her arm dancing to a Dolly Parton so song while she's vacuuming. She trips over the vacuum cleaner and breaks her arm or her leg, sprains it maybe, but she's laid up and she can't help. So Lady McIntosh is having to do a lot of the stuff that her helper is, and she's nursing her helper, Eileen. Eileen, that was her arm I see when I look back. <laughs> and the other curious thing about this book is, unless I am, I'm gonna flip through to see if I've missed anything. I have not. There is no direct dialogue. It's all in third person. So we hear what people say, but we hear it in, in uh, third person, not uh, in reported speech. Third person, not in first person. There's no quotation marks, no dialogue and quotation marks anywhere in the book. And that's strange, but uh, I'm not sure I'd have to, th I want to think about it once I've finished it to see how did that contribute to what I'm enjoying and was there any drawbacks to that? Uh, certainly no drawbacks that I can see as a, at present. I'm really, really enjoying it. Oh, and Mel read this about a year ago and she almost fell over when I told her a few days ago on Voxer that I was loving it. <laughs> she loved it too, by the way, but she didn't think that I would. All right. I will talk about the five that I finished, and I guess I'll just do them in chronological order. And I'll start to talk about this kind of aimless scavenger hunt I've been on at a couple libraries this week. One of them is at the Branch Library, which is a 10 minute walk from where I live. In recent visits, I've been scanning their fiction shelves for short books. And so this is how I found this one, and how happy was I to find one that I didn't know about, or I thought I didn't know about it. A short, a standalone short story by Rohinton Mystery, The Scream, published way back in the early 90s, I think. 1990. I think maybe in this edition it was a, a little bit more recent, in the early 2000s. So actually now that, I, now that I realize that, maybe this was... No, there's no reference to it being published. I know he published was it Tales of the Ferozia Bag. I don't think this story is in, in there. Anyway, this was for... World Literacy of Canada in 2006. So th that's when it was published in this edition. So uh, I don't know if it was published somewhere else, but anyway, I read it and I liked it very much. I didn't love it. It's a gorgeous physical book, even as a library book. Illustrations by Tony Urquhart and illustrations on every page. And it is about an old man in India and he is the most unreliable of narrators, and that's part of the reading experience, and that doesn't really float my boat, so maybe that's why I didn't love it. I'm just not into unreliable narrators. I mean, every person, every character in a book is unreliable, whether they're telling the story or not, but, you know, one that is really fixated on that, that doesn't excite me too much. But anyway, this old man is shunned by his family, if we're to believe his story. He is shunned by this family, and they all sleep in the other room, and they push him out into the living room to sleep at night. And he's sleeping in a narrow little strip of floor by, beside the grand piano. So it seems like it's a rich family. It's, you're never really quite sure where you are in terms of, is this a rich family or are they a poor family? But there's a grand piano in the living room, so they're obviously not poor. Sean, just keep going with the plot synopsis. There isn't much of a plot here. He uh, wakes up and hears screaming outside and hears other sounds of violence. Nobody else can hear it. And they all, his family in the next room, when he asks them about it, they think he's just going senile and he's imagining things, he's hearing things. And that's basically all that there is to it in terms of what the story's about. But what I did enjoy is he is incredibly pedantic and he uses the most highfalutin vocabulary. And at first it bugged me because I thought, Bro, Hinton, why are you using such abstruse, pretentious vocabulary? And then in the very next page, we realize that's actually a personality trait of the narrator. And then I really connected with it. So there's a lot of $64 words here. I'm going to get at least one full episode of In Other Words out of this book. He is worried that, that in, when he's sleeping, that the mice are going to eat his toes. I tell the ones in the back room, that's how he refers to presumably his family, it's never clear. I tell the ones in the back room about my fears of murine amputation. I looked it up, murine is the adjective for mice. He, uh, he loses his temper at his, these people he lives with, if they're his family, and he says one day, one day I lost my temper. Flossia now, Flossia now, 
pillificators. <laughs> I'll spell it. It is a word. <laughs> Stay tuned for a forthcoming episode of In Other Words. If you can get it at the library, you might enjoy reading it. And, you know, as an art object, as a, as a beautifully put together book, it might be worth having on your shelf as well. This week I read the entire graphic novel Our Colors by Gengoro Tagame, uh, translated by Anna Ishii, and I loved it. I didn't love it quite as much as I loved volume one of his My Brother's Husband. I loved that first volume so much, but I this one really grabbed me too. This one really touched me. There was just a few more things that I didn't like, but uh, this was a really touching, incredibly raw story about a young Japanese teenager coming out in high school. I never knew any gay Japanese people when I lived there other than Kenji that where I could talk on a deeper level about the kind of issues that are in here. This story is and I know that some people don't like it when I when white old, white old men like me start talking about the universal but to me this is a universal coming out story incredibly well told. His oldest friend is a straight girl and she has a crush on him and has always had a crush on him. He feels uncomfortable about that. He is in love with his straight jock best friend and is anguished about that and nervous as all get out. Uh, his parents are kind of wondering why he doesn't have a girlfriend yet. He's, in, he's interested in doing art and then one day, and I won't explain how, he meets a man who owns a cafe that's a weird cafe that nobody ever ever has any customers and this guy is a hunky older like maybe 60 year old openly gay Japanese guy is the Tencho the, the owner the manager of this coffee shop and they start up a friendship and that was really well done I mean especially it's so interesting that in his non-erotic manga Gengiro Tagame issues the sexual side of things there's no there was no sex in my brother's husband and there's no sex here and I, I'm curious about what that's about because he had been famous for a lot many years decades I think for making very erotic pornographic Japanese manga I have unfortunately not seen any of it yet if you want to anybody wants to send me some but while the men are all hunky and there's certainly no sublimating of longing and sexual longings, there's no sex in... This is the second, well, the, really the third book I've read by him that doesn't have any sex in it. But what it does have is just a really layered portrayal of the coming out experience. I just loved it. Yeah, I loved it. Um, what didn't I like about it? The cafe owner, the gay cafe owner's ex-wife well he's separated from his wife she comes back I didn't think that was particularly well done maybe, maybe that's all I gave it five stars so no there wasn't a whole lot that I didn't like maybe the other thing was that Sora the young high school teenager who comes out in the course of the story he likes doing art making art and the cafe owner guy commissions him to do a mural for the wall of his cafe and that storyline didn't really go anywhere Anyway, very, very small, small criticisms. This book uh, touched my heart. And the chunkiest book that I finished this week that wasn't a comic book is a book that I started in March for uh, Irish, the Irish Readathon. And that was the history of 20th century Ireland. We Don't Know Ourselves, A Personal History of Modern Ireland by Fintan O'Toole. This was per personally recommended to me by my reading buddy, the Irish novelist Ronan Hessian. I asked him about a year ago, I said, you know, I don't really know enough about Irish history and culture and I know that I'm missing stuff when I, because I love reading Irish literature, but I know that I'm missing stuff because I don't have the context. What do you recommend I read? And he recommended this one. And I thought, oh my God, it's 800 pages or something. I read it on ebook and I ended up listening to quite a bit of it as an audiobook, sometimes with the text open, sometimes not, because the narrator did such a good job that I could, I could, uh, just listen to parts of it. I loved it. It's one of the best accessible histories that I've ever read. Fintan O'Toole, as far as I understand it, he has, has his main career in life has been as a journalist and he's written quite a few books recently. I don't know if he's retired. I don't know much more than that about him, but the man can write and tell a story and craft the story of modern Ireland. And oh, there's just so many things I could say about it. Oh, I just, 
It's so accessible. You don't need to know anything about Ireland. He's very much of a cynical patriot. His anatomy of what is wrong with his own country was brilliant, uh, powerfully expressed, and just a, just a gripping read. Like the, the morality stuff, the misogynist, homophobic, racist stuff, all that f how fucked up Ireland is because of the Catholic Church, church and priests and the abuse and, and all, all, the, all the things. I mean, I feel self-conscious getting so worked up about it, but that's what the book did to me. It is a righteous indictment of his country and it's not like he ignores things that are hopeful, but he, it's really an anatomy of the horrors of 20th century Ireland. Um, he lost me in a few chapters that were about uh, business corruption and political corruption. A lot of uh, figures, money, and uh, shady dealings about money. Not that that isn't important, but it doesn't hold my interest. So those were the ones that I could, you know, fold my laundry and I could drift away for a bit and just get the gist of the what, what the scandal was about on a very general level and ignore some of the, all the facts and figures about it. But he really had me riveted talking about the social issues, about morality and abuse and women, the plight of women and oh my God. And the idea of the open secret, I don't, he has a better term for it, but that's basically how I would kind of paraphrase it. The things that Irish society permitted, even at the level of the clergy, like it was fine to go to England and have an abortion as long as you shut the hell up about it and came back and, and uh, lived, tried to live a good life. Just v uh, so much hypocrisy and stuff that he just, just with a razor sharp acuity and an awesome power to tell a story and make it so vivid and not only on the level of an anecdote, but as the perfect illustration of these larger uh, social ills. Uh, I won't say more than that. It, it was, I, I read it on ebook. I've just ordered a copy of the hardcover to have on my shelf and I'll be referring to it again and again. It's so well done. One of the best works of history I've read and I recommend it to you very, very highly. And you know what? What I was thinking as I got near the end of it in the last few days is, I don't think that we have a historian in Canada that's courageous enough to write a book like that about Canada because Canada's, Canada's no worse than Ireland or the States, but certainly no better. There's a lot of shithole countries in the world and Canada is but one. If any of you Canadian history buffs are out there and can suggest an irreverent, uh, clear-eyed work of Canadian history, please, please recommend it. So back to my scavenger hunt. Wednesday, I went to the university library and I told you before I got my alumni card and this was the first time that I borrowed books and I didn't intend to go borrow books, I just intended to go to campus, plunk myself down with the books that I was already reading and, you know, watch the cute guys walk by and read. And, and I did a lot of that too, but I couldn't stop myself from browsing the stacks. And I ended up borrowing, I think, eight books, but they were all really small books. And I'm gonna try to read as many of them as I can in the next little while. But I did read two of them since Wednesday. And there was something ineffably uh, transportive about just browsing around the library that I had been browsing around since I was 12 or 13 years old and just the smell of those rooms, those stacks, those shelves of books, it just took me back. I just relived so many memories. It was, it was so intensely laden with those memories that it was almost painful because I, and I, w I won't try to explain what I mean because I don't really know what I mean but it, there was a, almost a painfulness to it it was so intense and I loved it so I as I do when I'm in a used bookstore or a new bookstore or anywhere I look for the books that I've never heard of or the writers that I've never heard of and I also had the criteria of looking for short books and so I have read one by an author that I had never heard of and I'm gonna, not going to hold the book up very long because it's an ugly, bare back 
novel from 1943. It's called Brain and Ten Fingers by Gerald Kirsch. There's the book. <laughs> but what did kind of add a dimension of awe to the experiences when I got it home and opened it up, it's autographed by Gerald Kirsch. I'll come back to that autograph in a minute. So I'll put a gif of the dust jacket up. Gerald Kirsch, I have since learned, was a British-American writer. He was born in Britain of Jewish parentage and lived the last, I'm not sure how many years of his life in, in New York State. He has a cult following, so some of you may have heard of him. I'd never heard of him, but when I Google him, there's quite a few, there's quite a, some enthusiastic fans still today. I don't think this little novel from 1943 is still in print, but some of them are, and some of them have been made into movies. Yeah, there's quite a quite a following. I'm not a large following, but, uh, but more uh, larger than I would have thought. This novella, 76 pages. There's you know, yellow yellow pages and whatnot. Is set in World War II. It was published in 1943, so obviously set in early World War II. The characters are a a group of Yugoslav partisans fighting the Italians, fighting the Italian fascists that are encroaching on their lands. So it's set in Yugoslavia, what well, was Yugoslavia at the time. The story opens with the, the end result of a fierce battle where their ragtag group, uh, one guy has one of the most loved members of the, I don't know what they would be, the, the the group, the group, the guerrillas, one of the most beloved members, is mortally wounded but still alive, and he begs his comrades to just leave him there to die because they have to escape themselves or they'll all be killed. And one noble member refuses and carries him, and then they get to the river, and the river had overflown, had overflowed, overflown, and taken out the bridge. So they, they know they've got maybe an hour tops before the Italians catch up with them and kill them all. And there's no way out except to cross this tempestuous river. And they attempt to build a bridge with all the ingenuity that they have. And the story is told, it's a small scale story in that way, but it's told through the perspective of several of the people. It opens with a 14 year old kid that got attached to them. He was orphaned and they kind of picked him up and he, and it's through his, maybe 15 years old, and uh, we open with his perspective and we go into the perspectives of several of the other characters. And it's really well done. He's a beautiful writer. I gave it five stars because I loved the writing and I loved all the other things about the experience of finding the book and finding it was autographed. Um, and I did think that it was beautifully written. It's a man's book. It's a butch, straight man's book. And I loved a lot of things about it. And I thought the camaraderie and the teamwork and the, you know, courage of these men. The writing took you deep into the characters that made this adventure story. Uh, not just an adventure story. It was not just a war novel or novella. It was very much about uh, what each man, and there was one female character, brought out of themselves to make this, to, sa to save themselves in this very dangerous situation. Really well done. Now, um, it's limited by what uh, probably most male writers of that generation, the blind spots they have. So there is a female character and she had already been a sexual prisoner of the Italians but had escaped and so she's been very badly sexually violated and her character was not nearly as well done. And the sexism of the other characters towards her, you know, that took away from the reading experience. But I still really loved it, and I think I will seek out more of his fiction. Now, I've Googled him, of course, and in, in this inscription it says, For Major Metcalf, souvenir of a charming evening. Good wishes, Gerald Kirsch, January 44. There's a brief reference in Kirsch's Wikipedia biography that uh, he was probably he probably deserted the army, but yet he wrote a lot of war stories. And I, I don't know anything more about that. I'm very curious to find out more about that. So I don't know if he was already deserted in that '44. If he had, if not, did he desert? He must have deserted near the end of the war. So who is Major Metcalf? 
So I Googled Major Metcalf, and the only one that came up on Wikipedia, there must have been dozens of Major Metcalfs in World War II, so let's, let's get real, Sean. But still, the only one that Wikipedia had was this dude named Fruity Metcalf. That got my attention. Uh, otherwise, Ed, Ed, known as Edward Dudley Metcalf. Born 1887, died in 1957. He was an officer in the Indian Army and a close friend and equerry, how do you pronounce that, equerry? To the Prince of Wales, who later became King Edward VIII for the 10 minutes before he abdicated. He was active in World War I. I don't know why he was called Fruity. <laughs> I would like to know why. Does anybody out there know why? Uh, between the wars, that's where he got hooked up with the Prince of Wales, uh, who became Edward VIII, and he went with him on a royal visit to Japan. He did marry. Oh, and then he became a fascist. Oh, 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 I didn't know, didn't read this very carefully. Well, I don't like him nearly as well now. He complained about the Duke of Windsor after the abdication because he he was still working for him after the when he was Duke of Windsor and they were in, in France and then they had to evacuate from France because of the war and he felt abandoned by the Windsors and he had to because they, they they told him to bring their dogs over but it was kind of dangerous and they had already gone and uh, yeah, there's stuff here then he and his wife purchased a grand country house Little Compton Manor in 1939 near Morton in Marsh in Gloucester and they were still friends with the Windsors so whatever and he seemed to be lending some help to the Americans that had a that were building up their operations not far from where he lived as a lead up to D-Day in June 1944 so when was this so this is January 1944 I want to know is that is it Fruity Metcalf that he had a night out with the same year as D-Day and the same year that he kind of got involved with the Americans? I would, I'm curious to know. Never mind whether it was Fruity Metcalf or some other major Metcalf. How the hell the book got into the possession of the University of Saskatchewan Library? The book was really good. I loved the way I found the book. Um, I loved all these other associations and uh, yeah, I think if you can find a copy somewhere, you should try it. It might be on archive.org. I didn't check that. And the last book is actually the highlight of my reading week, and I had some really fabulous reading experiences this week. This one, I don't think this is going to end up being my book of the year, but in a way, this is, might be the, the book that has had the deepest impact on me of anything I've read this year. So maybe I need to look at what my criteria is for my book of the year. This is the bald-faced book, so I'll just show it to you quickly, but this is from 2020, um, Indelicacy by Amina Kane. I'll put the cover gif up. Oh, I love this book so much. It touched me and exposed me as I read it. I can't remember the last time I read, well, I think in, in a similar way to the Alberta Trilogy by Cora Sandell, this book kind of showed me to myself. This is a strange, of course, if it's revealing things about me, it's obviously a strange book, right? I don't need to, uh, I'm gonna have to move again. <laughs> ah. <sighs> okay, I didn't dig into this until I uh, read uh, the first couple lines of Eric Carl Anderson's review. No, I can't remember if it was on his video or on his blog, but anyway, I'm gonna read or watch his full comments, his full review, now that I've finished it. I just finished it about an hour ago. I said, there's the timelessness to it because there's no references where you can kind of situate the story in time. There's references to a museum, like art gallery, and, but there's nothing no, there's no microwaves, there's no cell phones, there's nothing where you can say, oh, this is set in such and such. It's published in 2020. Amina Kane is a Los Angeles-based writer, and this is her debut novel. I believe she's had, she had a couple of short story collections come out before this. I can't believe I've... And I'm revealing my geographical bigotry, but I can't believe I've connected so deeply with a book written by somebody who lives in L.A. 
It is the least LA type story that I could possibly imagine. The protagonist, I don't think we get her name until very near the end and it's something like Vittoria. I don't think we get it until the, penult the, the very penultimate chapter, Vittoria. I didn't notice her name anyway. Vittoria with a, a, an accent over the O. I'll put it down here. Anyway, um, her name's not really important to the story, obviously, or it wasn't for me. She is a writer wannabe, and she, she's estranged from her family, and she doesn't dwell on that at all in this first-person narrative. But she feels free of them because she doesn't have any contact with them. And she was working as a cleaning lady at, a, at the art gallery, and she was drawn to the paintings on the wall and she would go home at night and, and try to describe them and realized that she was a writer but she didn't she didn't have a lot of confidence in herself given her background and her status in life but she pursued this dream to write with a gritty determination i'm not doing this story justice because there's something about her character that is so there's a fragility to her and an uh, an openness to other people and the energy coming off other people and this was just uh, just vaguely reminiscent of Cora Sandel's writing but the personality is what um, I was so drawn to and that was such a mirror to me she didn't really trust herself but she had hope and it's not an overly psychologized story so she doesn't talk to herself in that self-helpy way. I think that's why I connected with it so deeply. But she keeps trying to write. And she's very cautious interpersonally and she treasures her friendships. She feels that she doesn't know how to have relationships, but she keeps trying. And she gets married, a, a rich guy picks her up at work and marries her and she doesn't really ever love him that much. but. He leaves her alone enough that she can continue with her writing, but he certainly does, doesn't understand her. But he gives her experiences that she never would have had otherwise that feed into her writing. And she fumbles through life and, and just... And, but, and because she's so open to experience, she ends up having such a rich, not only inner life, but uh, interpersonal life and... and there is a curiosity and a timid passion about her that just was a joy to read. And what the other thing was, some of the things that are in this book that she describes are incredibly banal and like they don't, it doesn't, they, the writing of them down doesn't transform them into anything. And I thought that was awesome too because she, she's a flawed being and the, and and I, the, a lot of readers probably wouldn't connect with this text and would think oh the writing's not that good oh there was just these ex moments of explosive beauty that would come out of her and there was a doggedness that was so endearing because it was so messy she was so <laughs> oh I, I can't I don't know how to finish that sentence but uh, and she also would occasionally get so angry that she would uh, um, cause a scene in public and, and and say nasty things to people that probably deserved it but that were just like oh whoa where did that come from so this is very much of a character driven novel And I mean, I think you'd know whether you're going to connect with it by reading the first two chapters, which are probably a page and a half each. And if it doesn't grab you, it's probably not for you. But this did grab me. It ended up being a really provocative, deep reading experience for me. And that's all I know how to say. I have already ordered my own copy. It's coming in the mail with the cover that you see here. And I, I think this is, this is going to be one of those books that, like Yi and Lee's collection of autobiographical essays, Dear Friend, blah, 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 long title, shows me to myself in a really beautifully unsettling way. And that's Indelicacy by Amina Kane. All right, so briefly, 
Yeah, I've been talking for an hour here. Jesus Christ. With all the books I've started and finished and stuff, I got room to start three. And the first one I'll tell you about, and I'm not going to say very much, is this is my only, probably the only th reading I'm going to do for Victober, and that's the biography of Queen Victoria's mother, titled Queen Victoria's Mother by Dulcie Ashdown. I talked about this book on a video. I'll put a link in the show notes. It was a video I made in years ago when I was obviously in Tokyo about the least popular books on my TBR, like they had the lowest number of ratings, not the lowest rating, but the lowest number of people had read it, those kind of books. And this was on there. I think nobody had read it maybe, or one person had read it. And I've been looking for a copy ever since. I finally got one and I'm going to do this as a buddy read with Leah, our first buddy read this year, I believe. And I'm very excited about that. I've read quite a bit about Queen Victoria's mother in the 17 biographies, that's a slight exaggeration, I've read of Queen Victoria and she was a fascinating woman and their relationship was fascinating and I hope to get a lot more insight from this. Alexandra who? I'm going to start. I can't wait for Indigathon next month but just stay tuned for my TBR people. I'm gonna read this for, uh, or even before Indigathon starts. This is Billy Ray Belcourt's memoir, A History of My Brief Body and it's a shorty. 130 pages. I may finish this this week and then start, but I thought it would be beautiful to pair this with his new debut novel, which is on the Giller shortlist. I think it's made the shortlist. I can't remember. Anyway, it was on the long list. It's just been published for about 10 days now. I'm going to go pick up a copy as soon as I finish this and read it. And it'll be really interesting to, don't know that I've ever done that, read a memoir and then a novel by the same author back to back so that, that's my plan but I'm gonna start this this week and I may even finish it and start the novel here's the cover and the third one I'm gonna start is uh, this collection of essays by the Saskatoon writer and my old English prof David Carpenter courting Saskatchewan I talked about it in my most recent book haul and it is also short so I'm planning to read it in my extension of Shorty September into October. And I also wanted to read this because he, he is launching his newest book. I believe it's a memoir. These are autobiographical essays, I believe. And he's launching it in about 10 days. And I'm going to go to that reading and hopefully talk to him. So get a signed copy. And I thought I'd like to read this before. And that is my reading week. Holy smokes! Hope yours has been great too, and thank you for watching. Thank you.